forget to get uh, Robert to announce that next Sunday we will have a, a meeting for Discipleship University at 4.30. So put that on your calendars. We want to make sure that uh, we uh, discuss some things that we need to discuss. Um, and a little bit behind on that, but I know it will be a good meeting and look forward to uh, planning together. There's no such thing as an unholy Christian. I'll let you that sink in for a moment. There's no such thing as an unholy Christian. Or maybe, we should put it differently, there's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't have to pursue holiness. As we discussed last week in a series that we began, which we titled The Pursuit of Holiness, holiness is an expected pursuit of the child of God. It's an inevitable result of being God's people. In Hebrews 12 and verse 14, which, which is kind of our key passage for this study, it says to pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Christians are called God's holy nation. And so holiness is what happens when God saves you. He sets you apart as His special people to live as, as He prescribes. And it, as we discussed last week, it means to live out the separation that God has worked in us through Jesus Christ, to be like Jesus Christ. But I don't think we can fully appreciate uh, that pursuit of holiness and, and really fully get a full definition of what it means to be holy. Last week we discussed, well, holiness means to be morally blameless, it means to be complete in Christ. But that definition is still somewhat deficient until we look at the holiness of God Himself. Until we look at who God is, which we want to do briefly this afternoon. Because that's what we're called to do in 1 Peter 1 and verse 16, which is a quoting of Leviticus 11 verses 44 and 45. To be holy, God says, is I am holy. I want you to be holy like me. So, together, let's look real quickly at our first point, which simply is the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Now, generally speaking, I would say that the vast majority of professing Christians believe in a, what we might refer to as a cultural holiness. Now, what I mean when I say a cultural holiness is that Christians tend to conform to the character and the lives of the Christians that surround them. So if the Christians that surround them, that they look up to, are living a certain way, or that they are with a lot, live a certain way, they tend to conform their character to those particular Christians. Now, initially that might seem like, okay, that's okay, but of course it depends on which congregation you're worshiping at and which culture you're worshiping in. But the reality is, is that the call for the Christian is not to conform to the other Christians around them but to conform to the character of God Himself, as we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. So holiness is a conformity to the character of God. We are image bearers, as we see at the very beginning of Scripture. We bear the image of God, and so it's our responsibility to reflect that image in purity and in love and in truth. And when we convey the character of God, when we show a conformity to the character of God within our lives, that is called holiness. In fact, we, sh we could say a good definition of holiness, and another definition, I think a fuller definition of holiness, is living out God's character or conforming to God's character. Now, central to understanding who God is, is understanding His holiness. It, did you realize that the holiness of God is the only characteristic of God in Scripture that's repeated three times whenever it's used? In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, the seraphim are surrounding God as Isaiah sees God within the temple and the seraphim are saying what? We sing it. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8 says the same thing within that heavenly scene. Now it's interesting, the Scripture doesn't say love, love, love. Right? Or, or um, peace, 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 or, or just, just, just. It says holy, holy, holy. Now that doesn't mean that God's not loving, and it doesn't mean that God's not peaceful and just. Absolutely He is. But what I think Scripture shows us is that God's holiness influences every aspect of who He is. It influences every aspect of His character. So His love isn't just love, it's holy love. 
His, his justice isn't just justice, it's holy justice. And we might refer to God's holiness as His transcendence, His set-apartness, His absolute purity. God is so high and so far above us and so set apart from us. But it does speak of God's moral perfection as well. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, John says, This is the message that we heard and we declare to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Now, when John says that in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, he's talking about moral and ethical implications. He's saying God is absolutely light and there's nothing that would diminish that. There's no sin or darkness that would diminish that light. And so God is absolutely perfect. He does absolutely what is right in all circumstances. I liked how one writer put it. He said, His perfect knowledge precludes any uncertainty in what is right and wrong. He always does what is just and right without the slightest hesitation. Now, you and I, if we're forced into an ethical dilemma, if we're forced into making a right or wrong decision, it might take us a while. We might hesitate. Do I want to do the right thing or am I going to do the wrong thing here? But God never has that hesitation. He always does what is right. In fact, not only does He do what is right, He is the standard of what is right. He is the right. He is, as Jesus would say in John chapter 14 and verse 6, the truth. He is the standard for goodness and beauty and all that is. And so since we are called to reflect the holiness of God. And here's the crazy thing. We are called to display God's character and set apartedness, if you will. I know that's not technically a word, but if you put a hyphen in between it, it makes it a word. His, his set apartedness um, to the world. So as God is separate from sin, His church is supposed to reflect that same separation. That we are, we are holy and we're reflecting His character. But the reality is, is that we are sinners. And so the only way that we can properly reflect the holiness of God is through the atonement of Jesus Christ. We, we can only become righteous through His blood. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Not for works of our righteousness, but by His mercy. And as we, are, as we mentioned, through His mercy, God sets us apart. He makes us holy. We're regenerated and we're made new. The sin that, that marred the image, God washes away through the blood of His Son. And we are put at right. We, we are there, if you read, we don't have time to read it, but Titus 2 and 11 and following, He talks about how He has redeemed us, a people who are zealous for good works, showing forth God's character to the world. But one of the key points that I want us to recognize this afternoon is this. That God's holiness isn't simply about abstaining from certain... Our holiness, reflecting God's holiness in us, isn't simply about abstaining from certain things. Now, it certainly is that. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3, Paul says, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Fornication and sexual immorality, premarital uh, sexual intercourse, none of that is allowed within the life of someone who's claiming to be a holy individual person. So there obviously are things that we must abstain from. At the same time though, just saying that holiness is about abstinence from certain things does not give a complete picture of what God's holiness is. Because remember, we're saying holiness is reflecting God's character. And God doesn't simply abstain from certain things. He is and does certain things. I think a good picture of this is found in Matthew chapter 5. Um, turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Real quickly. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 43. Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say you love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Now notice verse 45. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? But even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Yet even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, now what is Jesus saying there? What is He saying? He's saying that showing grace and mercy and love towards those who hate us is in fact an act of holiness. 
because it reflects God's character and His mercy and His grace towards rebellious sinners. Now, how many of you have thought of holiness in that way? I know that I, I generally haven't. When I look at praying for my enemies and loving my enemies, I mean, I think that's something I should do. But when I think of holiness, I don't necessarily think of that as a holy act. But when we reframe our thinking about holiness, that it's not simply about abstaining from certain things, it also includes that, don't misunderstand me, but that it's reflecting more fully the character of God. That means when I am praying for my enemies, when I'm loving people, when I'm showing grace and mercy to them, even when they're showing hate towards me, I'm actually reflecting the holiness of who God is. Now, um, if you think this type of holiness is difficult, because it is at times, we're being honest with you, we have to be intentional about this. And many, many years ago there was the what would Jesus do slogan, right? I, I think that was a good slogan that kind of got, you know, kind of became cliche, but I think it was good. And, and if you're wondering, you know, well, how can I ever know how to truly reflect the holiness of God? If we know Scripture, if we're meditating on Scripture and coming to know who God is, I can ask myself in any given situation, how would God act in this situation? How would Jesus act in this situation? Am I reflecting the character of Christ and how I'm dealing with this and how I'm handling this temptation and how I'm handling this situation and how I'm handling this person? Because if I'm reflecting what Jesus would do, I'm being holy in my conduct. And I'm being holy in reflecting the, the character of God. So I think that's a more full interpretation of what the holiness of God is and how we reflect that uh, in our own lives. Now secondly, real quickly... I do want us to uh, look at, very briefly, this idea of the fear of God, or the fear of the Lord, because this, this is a key aspect of this idea of what it means to live a holy life. Because in studying holiness, I, I've seen somewhat my own imbalance, I'm just being honest in this, I've seen somewhat my own imbalance in reaction to those who are constantly afraid of losing their salvation. I generally would say that's probably more of our issue in the church is that we don't have enough assurance. We don't have that blessed assurance that we sing about. We don't have the enough assurance in the sanctifying work of Christ. And so you have individuals who never know if they ever really are going to attain into eternal life. And you ask them, well, are you going to be with the Lord for all of eternity? They say, well, maybe. You know? Well, that's not the assurance that we have within Christ. We have a blessed assurance because of the grace and the mercy of God. And so I kind of tend to, because I think I've struggled with that as well and continue to at times, I tend to focus more on that and, and I at times neglect the fact that Scripture does talk about a certain amount of fear being a part of our life as Christians. And so uh, in the pursuit of assurance, we cannot forget that one of the main motivating factors in living a holy life to God, is the fear of the Lord. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2 and verse 13, to work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Now turn real quickly to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and we'll start, just start in verse 15. Now, this is a passage we're going to keep coming back to in our study, so it would probably be good if you could memorize it. It's not very hard to memorize this passage. But as he who called you is holy, you must be holy in all of your conduct. Now, notice the connection between that and verse 16. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Verse 15, you have to be holy and separate in all of your conduct. Why? Because God is holy in all of His conduct. Everything He does is holy. And so that's what we're pursuing is that type of holiness. Not just a holiness that's maintained on Sunday morning, but a holiness that we see in our life all the rest of the days of the week. But then notice verse 17. And if you call on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deed, deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time in exile. Now, when was the last time that you heard a major, major religious leader um, talk about the importance of fear within the life of the Christian? You don't hear that very often because we don't like to discuss that. And again, I think it's because we want to make sure we walk that line of being balanced, and I absolutely agree with that. But at the same time, the Scripture says that a Christian's life is to be lived in fear and exile. And I don't think this means that every day we're constantly wondering, am I saved, am I not saved, am I saved? That's not what he's talking about. What he is talking about is that as a Christian, you live in trembling reverence before the majesty of God. 
You live every day realizing that you are walking and living before the very eyes of God Himself. That, that you are in His presence. And that He has set you apart and you're called to live that. And if as a Christian you reject that lifestyle, if you reject your faith in Christ and you decide you're going to go back to live an unholy life, not talking about the Christian who's struggling to live a sanctified life, who's dealing with that battle between the inner man and the outer unredeemed body. We're not talking about that. We're talking about someone who has decided they're just not going to live for Christ anymore. And they reject that. He says He will judge you impartially. He will judge you. You're calling on Him as Father and you better know that if you're calling on Him as Father, you better be living the life that He has called you to live. And that's a life reflecting His character and His goodness and His holiness. It's a life lived in reverence of God. Now, interestingly enough, John seems to say the opposite of this. Okay? John seems to kind of contradict what Peter is saying. Now, he's not. But look at what he says in 1 John 4 and verse 17. 1 John 4 verse 17. John says there, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. How can we have confidence in the day of judgment? Because as He is also, so we are in the world. Therefore there is no fear... In love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected by love. Okay? So Peter's saying we need to live out our daily existence in reverence and fear. And John's saying, well, no, perfect love casts out fear. How do you reconcile those two things? Well, notice, if you will, that John says that we are being perfected by love. We're trying to be perfected by love. And what John, I think, is talking about here is that when you first become a Christian, your motivating factor many times in living a holy life is that you don't want to go to hell. You don't want to be condemned by the wrath of God. And let me just say, that's a legitimate concern, okay? That it's okay to be uh, doing those things for that reason. But that's not the state that God wants you to remain in. It's like uh, my children. My children, they obey me many times. Why? Because they don't want to be punished. Right? That's why they obey me right now. They don't want to be punished. Okay? And, and so they obey me because they don't want to be punished. But as they grow older, and they come to mature, and they come to know me, and our relationship grows, hopefully they're not obeying me simply out of fear of punishment. They're doing it because of love. Now, that doesn't mean they don't reverence me and respect me anymore. But rather the motivation has changed because they've been gradually perfected by love. And so our, as we live out holiness, it's not simply to live in, in constant fear of our salvation, but to see God for who He is and His holiness, to live in reverence in that, and to grow and mature in our relationship with God so that we are perfected by our love for Him. But the life of the Christian is a balanced life. That's why Paul says in Romans 11 and verse 22, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. So so we don't want to take either one of those at the expense of the other. We want to behold the goodness of God and the severity of God and allow that to motivate us towards a holy life. Now, within Scripture, the opposite of holiness is being ungodly and take a wild guess at what the other one is. Being unholy. Right? When you think of something being ungodly and unholy. You see, for example, of that in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. So when you're thinking, if you take that definition of what holiness we talked about a minute ago, reflecting the character of God, someone who is unholy and ungodly is someone who has refused to reflect the image of God in their life. There's someone who allowing their lives to be dominated by sin and they have not been redeemed, they have not been set apart by the blood of Christ, and, and they are not fully reflecting the character of God. But here is the beauty of this, though. And it's the importance for the church. Whether people realize it or not, people want to know God. People want to know Jesus Christ. And, and I, I'll give you an example of that. I want you to think about the one person in your life that you just really enjoy being around, that you respect that you love, that you feel is just a genuinely good person. Someone who makes you want to do better. 
and someone that you just feel like a better person when you're around them. I can almost guarantee you, maybe not across the board, but I can almost guarantee you that whoever that person is, they are trying to live a godly life. They are trying to live a godly life. As humans, we are automatically drawn many times towards people who are living holy lives, truly reflecting the holiness the Scripture talks about. And the reason I think that is, is because they are reflecting more fully the image of God to us. And we want to know God. And we want to be close to God. And so we're drawn to those type of people. And I'm convinced that if as Christians, we will live out that holiness that we see within Scripture individuals will be drawn to that. And here's the question that you must ask yourself. What kind of God are you reflecting to your friends, to your family members, to your community? What God are they seeing in you? What are they, what are they learning about God by the image that you're reflecting to them? We're going to extend the invitation this time. And if you have needs for prayers or, or want to uh, obey the gospel, whatever your need is, you can come. Together we stand and as we sing.